Hi, we're going to get started, I believe. Um, but then, you know, I'm always the last to know if this is the beginning or not. Maybe we're in the middle. Um, it feels sort of like the beginning, but it's the beginning of this. But we've been here for a while. Um, I'm uh, Andreas Teuber. I actually teach at Brandeis, and um, I teach in the philosophy department. The first speaker is to my right, um, who is... Um, uh, can I, am I going to pronounce this right? Rod, Rod Yeah, you're fine, you're fine. No, it's <laughs> close, right? It's yeah, not, yeah. It, it's phonetically off. It's perfect. Yeah? I'm going to say it again. You're going to say it again and it's going to be t totally different. <laughs> uh, Rao. Yes. Awesome. Uh, phew, right? Uh, they don't teach you this in graduate school. Um, so uh, he is going to say a word or two about the uh, judicial um, response and review of controversial issues uh, that we've actually already been talking about to some extent. Indeed. Yeah. And um, uh, we'll then continue. Two of us are going to talk a little bit about and bed cars influences. Um, and um, uh, Siraj is going to be talking about growing up in a casteist society, but also bring in theoretical uh, material as well in discussing this. And uh, Jeremy is going to talk, I'll introduce everybody just quickly very much again when they come up. But Jeremy's going to talk about three social movements, all of which are anti-caste movements, and the question he's going to raise, and he's going to tell us something about them, is why aren't they working together? Of course, this is something that happens here in the United States as well. Um, so without, so please, uh, uh, we will start, and we will go for 15 minutes. And, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Badri Rao. <laughs> That's easy, I'm assuming. People have called me battery, and so I'm used to uh, this. Uh, how do you manipulate the computer? Um, oh, it's right there. OK. All right. Now, my brief is to talk for just about 15 minutes, and I've been repeatedly warned that it has to be a word or two. So you might find me go blue in face, become apoplectic, and my, I might even collapse from massive coronary thrombosis, and if that happens, it's because I want to beat the deadline. My goal here is to take the argument that Professor Thorat propounded in the previous session a bit further. Now, we all have understood that there is an um, umbilical connection between caste oppression and religion, that religion is the site where the oppressive practices of caste are entrenched, now, the best solvent for this malaise, obviously, is the law. And India, as we all know, has a first-rate constitution operating in a third-rate democracy, as Nani Palkiwala once pointed out. And uh, that is the reason why we have to examine how the justice system has dealt with caste-based oppression issues of religion and so on. The main thesis of my argument is that if you look at the entire jurisprudence concerning religion, you will notice two things. Number one, there are several instances where the justice system has come out quite progressive. Unfortunately, this was in the past. In the recent decades, the jurisprudence clearly points to a strong majoritarian bias, a great desire to homogenize what is indeed a very plural tradition, and the urge to assimilate the uh, minorities, lower castes, and so on and so forth. Now, the notion of secularism, which is what India has embraced, is deeply problematic. It has become a swear word. And uh, I'm not going to delve into it. Broadly speaking, it stands for equal respect for all religions. How you make it justiciable is a big challenge. The Supreme Court has waded into it. It has uh, often uh, done so in uh, less than uh, 
uh, appropriate ways, juristically ingenious ways, and that is what I want to get into. Now there are, let's be very fair, significant challenges in regulating Hinduism, unlike Abrahamic faiths. You could uh, chalk this up to civilizational imperfections, but we have them, uh, we have inherited them, and that, to that extent, the task of nation building is much more challenging in India. Furthermore, as you will agree, hopefully, as Marx pointed out, the principles of justice in any society can never be higher than the socioeconomic principles of that society. And you see that very clearly in the field of uh, religious jurisprudence. The courts have time and again tried to make sense of how to uh, regulate justice and they have not always been very successful. The elites, of course, do not want to do it because uh, it is messy, electorally very expensive, and it is not something that will redound to their benefits. So the expectation all along has been that the justice system will step in and fill this lacuna. It has done so in a very patchy manner. Thus, for instance, 1954, we had the first case, Commissioner of Religious Hindu Endowments versus Lakshmi Dutti S. Swamiya. In this case, I'm not going to go into details. The court had to rule on issues of freedom of religion, and the court said that only essential aspects of religion will be afforded freedom. Now, what constitutes an essential aspect? Well, the court said it has to be ascertained with respect to the doctrines of the religion itself. Now, Religion 101, students will tell us that all religions are multivalent, they speak in many voices, they have many traditions, you have the book tradition, you have the lived tradition, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, how do you determine all of this? The essentiality test does not go into it, okay? 1961, you find that the court said, in addition to being essential, a religious practice must also be rational in order to fall within the ambit of freedom of religion. So only those aspects of a religion which are rational will be protected, others will not. Who determines what is rational? The court said, of course we, 26 learned people of the Supreme Court, we will determine. Do you have any competence? Have you got training? Did you go to Brandeis? No. <laughs> Judges of the Supreme Court, like their counterparts in the US, are omniscient and therefore they have waded right into issues by looking at books and harassing their clerks to find out some details and it's a big mess, okay? 1963, there was this Govind Lalji Maharaj who was the state of Rajasthan case and in this case the court said in order to determine what is essential in the religion we must keep in mind the perceptions of the community. Does a religious community ever speak in one voice? Who are you going to ask? Well, that is not clear. Then the court said, if there is no unanimity, doesn't matter. Look at the evidence that the parties produce. Of course they will produce evidence that suits their argument. Okay? If that doesn't work, go to the tenets of the religion. Well, religion again speaks with many voices. That's all right. If nothing works, the common sense of the judges will kick in and you will be fine. That has not happened, as you will see, okay? Now, with respect to the practical ways in which these principles have been played out, there are two things that you have to keep in mind. Cow slaughter cases. The court, armed with these broad, bright line principles, waded right into the question of cow slaughter. Bihar in 1955, I think, came up with the anti-cow slaughter legislation. It was challenged in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, we are not going to afford any uh, protection to the freedom of religion argument because slaughtering a cow is not essential for the practice of Islam. Secondly, the court said, Article 48 of the Constitution says that cow slaughter must be banned. Well, that is part of Section 4 of the Constitution, which deals with the directive principles of state policy. And directive principles of state policy are just that. They are directive principles, they are not justiciable. The court selectively retrieved 
from the Constitution, things that would serve its interests. The judge who wrote the majority opinion years later agreed that he was swayed by majoritarian concerns. Much later, 1962, there was this Saifuddin Sahib case. Now in this case, the person in question, Saifuddin Sahib, was the head of the Dawoodi Bohra community. He said, I must have the freedom to excommunicate errant members of my flock. If I can't do that, how can I keep my flock together? And Bombay then said, no, you cannot abrogate the civil liberties of your followers, and they've passed the Bombay Prevention of Excommunication Act. This act was upheld by the Bombay High Court. Matter went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't pass an act like that. How is this poor guy going to lead his flock? And therefore, they rendered it unconstitutional. It was read down. So you see, this is flip-flop, flip-flop. You see this happening all the time, OK? With respect to Hinduism, what does the court have to say? First thing you have to understand is, in these two cases that you see here written in red, there was no need for the court to go into an exegesis of Hinduism. That was not the issue before the court. In the common law tradition, a court has to follow the adversarial procedure, which means only issues defined by the parties and that have a bearing on law or fact need to be adjudicated. The court cannot, out of the blue, pull out a topic and say, well, this is interesting, let us pontificate on it. But that was exactly what happened. The first case, Shastri Agni Purushadasji, was about the Swami Narayan group. They opposed the Temple Reentry Act. They said, you know, this doesn't apply to us. We are a minority faith. Okay? And then the court said, let's tell you that is not the case. And they went into an exegesis of Hinduism. They said Hinduism is a way of life. This is the most cliche thing that you can expect from the justice system again and again and again. Unfailingly, this year in January, the court came out with the same argument and said, Hinduism, Hindutva, these are all ways of life. Come on, don't make a fuss, embrace these things, okay? The court also then said, we will identify the central features of Hinduism. Now think about it, people who have BA, LLB, trying to wade into a topic over which many of you here have spent a lifetime. They are trying to say Hinduism is simple to define. Centrality of the Vedas, belief in reincarnation, notion of moksha. You say yes to these three, bingo, you are a Hindu and you can't escape. Okay, second point, welcome, wealth tax, uh, tax uh, issue. This guy Sridharan was married to a Christian woman and they had a son. The issue was, for the purposes of assessing tax, is this a Hindu joint family? The court did not have to get into an exegesis on Hinduism, but the judges love their role as social reformers. They reform from the bench, just as they rule from the bench, another peculiarity of the Indian justice system, and they talked about the same things. Now, 73, there was a 13 judge bench that looked at case one and Dubharti. This is a very foundational case in the constitutional jurisprudence of India. This guy, Keshwan and Dubharti, was the head of a religious institution. He did not like the fact that the state was taking away land, and he went into this question before the court and said, look, you cannot deprive me of my land. It will prevent me from following my faith. The court then went into the whole nine yards of determining what constitutes the basic structure of the Constitution. And lo and behold, this time they were progressive. They said secularism is part of the Constitution. It might interest you to know that secularism figures only twice in the Indian Constitution, which is a massive document. It's a lawyer's paradise. Lawyers make a lot of money in India because this is a huge document riddled with, riddled with anomalies. First time secularism is mentioned in the preamble, which is not justiciable. India is a secular socialist republic. Second time, the constitution says that the government can regulate secular aspects of a religion. Now, the court said secularism is an inalienable part. 94, there was this Bombay case. What's this case? 1992, there was the Babri Masjid uh, 
uh, issue resulted in massive Hindu-Muslim clashes. The Congress was in power at the federal government level. They said that BJP ruled states must be dismissed under Article 356 of the Constitution. President's rule must be imposed because they have flouted the principle of secularism. They have not upheld secularism and therefore they don't deserve to be in office. The BJP government said to dismiss went to court. And the Supreme Court went into this matter and said that Keshwananda holds secularism is central. If you flout secularism, you go have to go. And politics and religion cannot be mixed. Well, so far, so good. Just 21 months later, the Supreme Court had a change of heart. And it delivered a slew of judgments called the Hindutva verdicts. Seven distinct but related verdicts involving 12 leaders of the BJP and the Shiva Sena, whose elections were sought to be set aside under Section 123.3 of the Representation of People's Act. Now, if I had an hour, I could enlighten you about the nuances of 123.3. It is fantastic. But we shall move on because I know I am a slave of time. So, first case, you have Ramesh Prabhu Vikunte. Now, in this case, the court says invoking Hindutva does not constitute a corrupt practice. 123.3 says, if you invoke religion, either your own or your opponents, either to solicit votes or to appeal to the electorate not to vote for someone on the basis of their religion, well, that constitutes a corrupt practice and you are liable to lose your seat. The court said no. Invoking Hindutva is fine. It's a way of life. It's not a corrupt practice. It's a state of mind. You are in India. You have to be Hindu. Okay. Next case, Manohar Joshi. Same deal. The court said this man's statement. The first Hindu state will be established in India. They said no. It's just an expression of an interest of a hope. You don't want to deprive this man of his seat. They let him keep his seat. Okay, third case, Kapse Vihar Bhajan Singh. You found is, this is an interesting case because this man, Mr. Kapse, who ran for the Lok Sabha, the lower house of the parliament, he was on the dais with the top leaders of the BJP who made vituperative uh, speeches against minorities, Muslims, and so on threatened the lower caste and said, you have to embrace Hinduism, don't, don't, don't do your Dalit thing, and so on. It's all on tape, though. And the manifesto of the BJP clearly stated that secularism is something they have no faith in, they don't want to uh, uphold it if, or if they are in office. Now, Kapsi said, yeah, they may have said so, but I didn't give them my consent. 123.3 says you can proceed against a candidate or his or her agent only if you can establish that they have uh, provided their consent. Notice how the law is framed. The bar is high for a lawyer to prove that someone has the scienter or the intent which is manifested in the form of a consent is a high bar to live up to. But the court said, well, this is a quasi-criminal case. What do you expect? You have to prove your case beyond reasonable doubt or else you're out. And therefore, though the manifesto said that the party does not believe in secularism. Again, one small anomaly. When a party wants to register with the Election Commission of India, they have to give an affidavit. And in the affidavit, they say that they are swearing to uphold not just the unity and integrity of India, but also the Constitution and all its provisions, including the fact that India is secular. So how can you give an affidavit under oath and then say something quite opposite? What is more egregious is the court did not find this anomalous. The court said, well, you know, this man, Mr. Kunte Kapse, he didn't write the manifesto. It would be unfair to go after him. He's a poor guy. This is a big party. Someone else wrote it. So his consent was not sought, and therefore he was let go. Then came this Muhammad Aslam case. This man went to court and said, Your Honor, you have 
handed down a slew of judgments, all of which have sanctified Hindutva, which is xenophobic, which is anti-minority, assimilative. We don't want that. Would you please reconsider? The court said, nonsense. There's no need for it. Hindutva is a way of life. Don't oppose it. Then the man said, your honors, but this goes against Burmai, where you clearly laid down that secularism is an inalienable feature of the Constitution. The judge said, no, Burmai does not deal with electoral law. This deal with, deals with electoral law. What are you talking? Case dismissed. Okay. Now, if you know anything about the justice system in India, the Supreme Court of the United States hears about 90 cases every year in India. Over a thousand cases are filed every week. Indian judges suffer from a peculiar disease called jurisdictional hunger. Nothing is beyond their can and capacity. It can be the simian problem in Mumbai or Delhi. Okay, how do you deal with monkeys? Well, the judges have an answer. What do you feed the monkeys? The judges have an answer. How many peanuts? The judges have an answer. Where do you send them? You send them to Bhopal. And then they say, the zookeeper has to file a report. There has to be compliance, OK? And then the next case is, what about billboards on highways? Well, they are distracting. Get rid of them. Next. This is governance through the bench. We have an awesome arrangement. All right, so the court said Bomma is irrelevant. No need to go into it. And the net result is Hindutva has been enshrined. There have been several other such anomalous judgments. Two things need to be borne in mind. Number one, electoral laws are in place only from the date of the notification of elections till the date of announcement of results. Till that day, you can make the most obnoxious remarks you are still okay. Technically, you are not. Under section 153A and 153B of the Indian Penal Code, you can be proceeded against for creating hatred among the different communities. But there's a catch. If someone criticizes me for being a Muslim, I have no recourse. The state has to go after the uh, accused. Please keep this in mind. The state has the right, and the state will never go after the accused that Shiv Sena was never proceeded against. Okay? Next. You see this practice? This is a very obnoxious practice followed by the Malaykudiya scheduled tribe in the state of Karnataka, the state I come from. This is in a temple called the Subramanya Temple, and you have these guys, they are rolling on plantain leaves on which the upper castes have eaten. And there's a superstitious belief that it's good for your skin, it's good for your soul, of course, and it's desirable. Now, people went to court, the Karnataka High Court, and said this is unacceptable, it's unscientific. Recall what I said earlier, freedom of religion is afforded only to the rational aspects of a faith, only to the essential aspects of a faith. So people said, this is not an essential part of their faith. This is unscientific. Directive principles say that the state is committed to the promotion of humanism and scientific temper. And so in accordance with the directive principles, this practice must be banned. The court said, no, anyone can do it. You too can go. You can roll. It's supposed to be good for your soul. This is in the judgment, I will show you. It's right here, I can read it out. And therefore the court said nothing doing. Now, thankfully all is not lost. This is in the Supreme Court, okay? So the question then is, what do you do? Why do you have these anomalies? First of all, the social background of the judges. Many of them are upper caste. There are lower caste judges. There's a former Dalit who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Justice Balakrishnan, these folks have been co-opted. They join their oppressors and they continue to oppress, so you can't expect anything from them. And then there is this great urge to build a strong India. How do you do this? Make everyone Hindu. Then there'll be no problems, okay? Recently, the lawyers went to the uh, Supreme Court and said, Your Honor, people are being oppressed in Kashmir, the judges said, ask them to stop throwing stones, and then we'll give you relief, 
Okay, so that's how the justice system works. Courts don't have expertise in religion, yet they do not hesitate to wade into religious controversies. Okay, uh, there are several such instances that I've not talked about. Judges genuinely believe in the superiority of Hindutva and think that Hindu nationalism is good. They have a built-in majoritarian bias. Now keep this in mind. What does it take to be a judge? You have to have your BA, LLB, both of which lack content, <laughs> both of which are not critically taught. Those of us who have been through education in India know this. So how can you expect judges to be flaming progressives just after they are elevated to the bench? They reflect the widespread prejudices and stereotypes of society, and that earns them brownie points. Also, many of them are smart, they know the truth, but they are not going to speak from the bench because someone might throw acid on them, someone might hurt them, and so on. But the biggest concern is the last point. Most judges, after retirement, I hope you know that judges live like colonial potentates in India. You know, they have massive bungalows, they have a gardener, they have a cook, they have a driver. You don't want to give up all that. And so they pass verdicts that humor the establishment. They want a sinecure. They want to be the head of a certain panel. I'll tell you something. Right after the Babri Masjid demolition, there was a judicial commission that was asked to go into it. You know what? It was given three months' time, three, to come up with findings. This commission, hold your heart, took 21 years. And during this period, the judge who headed the commission enjoyed the rank and privileges of a cabinet rank minister. Why would he write it soon? Okay, so that is where the situation stands. It is scary, it is episodic, and it is extremely unhealthy. I stop here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeremy Rinker will now say a word or two about, or three probably, about <laughs> three anti-caste social movements. Uh, Let's see if I can get this up here. Alright, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my, my title of my talk has changed slightly as well um, from the beginning. And I, I just want to say thanks first off to the organizers in the Boston Study Group for allowing me to, um, to be here and to talk. Uh, the, the, the title of my talk is, as you see, United uh, Anti-Caste Activism, Strategic Systems Thinking for Narrative Change in Caste Oppression. And uh, I think it's great in terms of following on with some of the conversations we've had uh, already, and I want to thank Dr. Thorat for his talk earlier. He mentioned this idea of separating the people from the problem. Uh, down the street here at, at the Harvard School of Negotiation, a guy named Bill Urry put that in a book many years ago called Getting to Yes. And he also mentioned Alport, who talks about contact theory, right? And one of my concerns all along with studying CAST has been trying to figure out how do you actually get people to come together and have dialogue and, and, and create contact. So I teach in a, in a multidisciplinary field of peace and conflict studies at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Um, and my remarks today come from chapter three of a book project I'm currently working on about rights, identity, and awareness in anti-caste social movement. Um, and I've been struck in, in doing research for this book how little comparative analysis between different social movement forms are happening within anti-caste activism and within, within anti-caste social movement uh, theory. Um, I hope to challenge us today to think of anti-caste movements across India as a system as opposed to thinking of caste as a system. I want to think about anti-caste activism as a system and the narratives we tell about them as feedback loops within the system. Michel Foucault, as we all know, once uh, quipped that even though people know a lot of things, they rarely know what they do, what they do does, 
right? They don't know how things operate in terms of what they do oftentimes. And so my work is really aimed at trying to kind of understand the role that narratives play in conditioning um, ca cast oppression and cast uplift. Um, so I've spent the last uh, couple of decades interacting with three distinct anti-caste social movements. Let me start first by giving you a couple, and I've mentioned some of these already, some kind of important starting points for what my work is. Um, based on this idea of, of systems analysis and systems thinking, an important function of almost every system is to ensure its own perpetuation. We certainly see that with caste. Um, but I would argue that anti-caste activism, not just caste, can be studied as a system, as I mentioned. And by looking at narratives as texts that do not describe things, but they actually do things, in, in Vivian Jabri's sense, I'm trying to kind of uh, challenge ideas of moving beyond this idea of structural violence as agentless. And Gautam, in my field, Johann Gautung is oftentimes thought about as kind of the grandfather of peace studies. Um, he's the guy who coined the term structural violence. Um, and kind of pushing past that, trying to get an idea that he argued that it was agentless and therefore, uh, and, 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 and Sarah Cobb actually says it's, it's because it's agentless in his sense, it's hard to story. So we must therefore talk of narrative violence in Cobb's sense. She adds a new element to to violence, not just structural, cultural, and direct. We all know what direct is. Direct is, you know, somebody physically perpetuating violence against another person, which we see, of course, in caste dynamics all the time. Structural violence, we've talked about much here, is the idea that, that structures themselves perpetuate violence. And cultural violence, the elements of culture that play into perpetuating violence. Um, Cobb talks about narrative violence as kind of at the core of all systems of oppression. And she says that narratives are dynamic and they can create either a state of, a sec, a sec, a state of exception or I argue uh, important means to transform the caste system. And so I'm, I'm looking at both how narrative perpetuates caste but also how it can be used as a way to, to overcome caste. Um, so, so I've, you know, I've already hinted at these assumptions, and so I've, I, over the last decade, I've been interacting with three distinct social movements, some of which have been talked about already. I was glad to hear Christopher Queen give talk on, on TBMSG, uh, the Association of the Friends of the Buddhist Order of the Three Realms, which is a Pune-based organization, and Bedkar, and Bedkar Buddhist organization. Uh, I was a 2013 Fulbright, uh, Scott, Nehru Fulbright Scholar in um, Benares and worked with a group called the People's Vigilance Committee on Human Rights, very much a human rights based anti-caste movement, one that you have probably are less familiar with. And then of course our lunch uh, video talked a bit about BOMSEF. And I, I, ha I have to say at the beginning too to just kind of give a shout out to Tanoj Meshram who is a PhD student here for connecting me with many of the BOMSEF uh, cadres as I was in India over the last summer. Um, and so these three movements, I've been trying to understand it as a kind of a system. How do they interact together in a way, or don't interact together in a way? Because they're actually at, at times working at cross purposes. Um, so if I had more time, I could go into who each one of these is. I think you know pretty well what they are. The next three slides give you a little bit of overview of these three movements, when they were founded, who their important players are. You saw a picture of Dharmachari Lokamitra, uh, one of Sangharakshita's disciples from the TBMSG movement and the founder of that movement. I want to focus specifically on them. So you see on the slide various things about this movement. The idea that they're organizing around Buddhist identity, and that Buddhist identity, I think, is critical for them, right? Trying to develop and, and follow Ambedkar's, or Ambedkar's organize, agitate, and educate, but really focusing on the organizing around identity. Um, the PVCHR you may be less familiar with. It's a member-based uh, human rights movement, began in 1996 in Varanasi by a guy named Lenin Raghuvanshi. I didn't put his name up here. But they're uh, uh, a rights uh, and education, they're focusing very much on rights, education, and agitation. Very much a secular organization, not promoting a Buddhist identity in any sense of the way. And in fact, talking about kind of neo-Dalit movement in their terms, right? This idea that, that 
coming together in a way to bring together Dalits, Muslims, Adivasis, to work together to build people-friendly society and people-friendly villages. Very much connected to the UN and to, to uh, ideas of, of kind of multinational human rights work, uh, and international human rights work. Uh, they're, they're doing some, I got very interested in this group, particularly around issues they were doing and, and work they were doing around testimonial therapy, taking custodial, people who are involved in custodial torture and working with them to build human rights workers on the ground. The third one of these groups that, that, that I'm studying is BOMSTEF. The, the, um, you're, familiar, you're all probably familiar with the Backward and, and Minority Caste em Employees Federation, founded in 78 by Kanchi Ram and D.K. Caparde. Um, as, as civil servants, they were interested in, in ensuring that, that um, Ambedkar's birthday was included in a list of state, of state holidays. At that time, it wasn't. They were arguing for this. And they've, they've really connected in this way of organizing and educating around Mulanavasi identity or an indigenous identity. And, this kind of, and we heard at lunch this kind of perspective of, a, of an inclusive Dalit, Idavasi, and Shudra community or OBCs that are connected and they're 85% of the majority population, the Bahujan population of India, and trying to organize them in a way as a bulwark against Brahmins. Um, and so these three movements you might think are, are quite different, quite um, quite uh, dis diffuse in some ways. And, I, and, and as I started to study them, of course, I've realized these differences between them. But I've also started through, through narrative and, and interviewing people within these movements started to, 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 to gain a sense of, of um, the, the power of their stories and the connection of their stories. So I'm going to briefly share three narratives of, of one from each movement. And I'm going to quickly go through these. I'm going to read a couple of them. I'm going to kind of tell you the first one. Um, and they come from different trips I've taken to India. And then I want to come back to the idea of how can narrative be used as a, as a way forward? How can we use narrative not just as a, as a perpetuation of caste injustice, but how can we use it as a way to shift the narrative and, and, and deal with narrative violence, as Cobb calls it. Um, so the first story comes from a speech that Lokamitra, Dharmachari Lokamitra of the TBMSG gave at a girls' hostel in Gurwada. In fact, uh, I think Christopher was there as well, as, as he stood up after a, program, a cultural program event and prior to dinner, I feel a bit like I'm in that mode now, right? Prior to dinner and talking, uh, he stands up and he gives a, a kind of very almost like a political stump speech in which he says, the government of India must not want girls to learn. All this would lead one to think there must be some discrimination here. 60 to 70 years ago, these girls would have had absolutely no chance at education due to their status as untouchables. But look at what, they've done, what we have done. Look at what we have done. So there's a lot in that, right? This, this push for, for kind of mobilizing around identity justice trying to organize the community around, look what we as, as Ambedkar Buddhists have done. Look what the Buddhists have done, right? This kind of focus on that. So there's a lot in that, in that kind of, that, that story or that narrative, and I go into a, 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 a longer kind of description of it in the paper. Um, the, so let me jump to Uttar Pradesh in 2013, where I was a Fulbright Nehru scholar and spent time with the PVCHR. And we were, I was going to various villages watching what they called their honor ceremonies, which were ceremonies in which people who had gone through testimonial therapy process were actually standing up in front of their village and telling their story. Very heart, harrowing stories about torture and uh, bonded labor and issues related to those things. And I was struck by this 14-year-old this girl named Mori who I encountered in a, in, a, in a small village called Robert Ganj, Robert's Ganj in, in Uttar Pradesh. And I'm just going to read you a, a small section of this story. Robert's Ganj is a small village of about 50 people, about three hours' drive from Banaras City. A tribal community of grass cut it, cutters and weavers, this small village is underserved by the nearby district magistrate, and health issues abound. Villagers, in addition to having to walk half a kilometer away to receive water from a dam, also experience problems with tuberculosis and extreme malnourishment and even starvation. Of the 50 families in the village, 
each have been touched with death by starvation. Usually their youngsters are the, are the victims. An account of my own interaction with a 14-year-old girl named Maury emphasizes the PDCHR shift to rights awareness and education from a very secular perspective. Maury, 14 years old, in May 2013 when I met her, only studied until the fifth form before dropping out of school to try to help her family. Maury's mother had seven children, three of which had died of malnutrition. Her father is an alcoholic rickshaw walla that is rarely at home, and her mother also struggles with alcoholism. She carries her seven-month-old sister, who already herself shows signs of malnutrition. Despite Maury's sad predicament, she smiles often and becomes completely transfixed by one of the PDCHR's activists' iPhones. She wanted to play with the iPhone constantly. Um, and look at pictures, she was fascinated by it. She seems to be the only person in the village capable of a smile, and she is eager to show us around the, on this 100 plus degree day in the middle of, of July, uh, or sorry, the middle of, of May. Um, sun, sun blaring down, she eagerly shows us her house and asks many questions of us on the way. She wants to know what I do. I respond, I'm a teacher. She then asks, not what I teach, but rather, how do you teach? This is not a mistake in translation. I check it twice but with my interpreter. The question is telling because it is not only assumes an innocence of my young interlocutor, but also belies a true belief in her own ability to sap all my knowledge in this brief inter interaction. Hungry for change, she is the energy of her village that PDCHR, PDCHR taps for human rights activism. And so they're building on folks like Maury to build human rights activism. The final story I'll tell is from the Bombsef movement and Mulan of Asisanga and, and, and staying with some friends and, and, and spending a little bit of time in Amravati in Maharashtra. And I had actually, this, so this is the summer, earlier in the summer, the movie, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, Sairat, had come out and had taken India by storm. And I hadn't actually seen it initially, and so I was eager to figure out how I could get on and watch Syrot. And so if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a, it's a great movie, Marathi movie that kind of took India by storm and made lots of money. And so I watched Syrot one night and, and then had this interaction with a, a person I'll call Nitin um, about, about Mary. And I had had some conversations with him prior about his daughters and, and how, you know, how he felt about intermarriage and endogamy and, and questions of caste. Um, so one final in interaction with a Bombsef Mulanavasi Sangha activist in Amravati last summer underscores the social movement's drive to educate for an organized identity. I have been studying with, uh, I had been staying with Nitin and his family for about three days when one evening I decided to stream the recent film Syrod that had taken India by storm a few months earlier as I lay in bed. The next morning, over breakfast, I told Nitin I had watched Syrat last night. This opened a frank conversation about intercaste marriage. The father of two daughters, Nitin, had repeatedly told me his girls could marry anyone they wanted. When I pressed even a Brahmin, Nitin conceded, well, anybody but a Brahmin, anyone but a Brahmin. My, my shock must have been evident as, as, I, as this contradicted what he had previously told me. Quickly, Nitin began justifying his statement, well, he said, quote, Brahmins would bring their culture into this house or into our house, end quote. Unsatisfied that this, explana unsatisfied that this explanation that he had given, uh, he, he, he kind of continued, quote, slowly my, my daughter would be overtaken by this Brahmin belief, end quote. While this story may seem ordinary, the raw honesty of it, I believe, was quite rare. I had never had somebody actually say that to me. Um, and so I think this story in some ways differs from the, the first two stories that I told, uh, the first two being very much about uplift and, and, and sapping into the power of, of, of activists to, to make change. And I think that is the kind of so what for me. Why do anti-caste narratives matter? Activist narratives within the wider anti-caste movement act as feedback loops for perpetuating narrative violence and perpetuating the caste system. They also can act as a unifying force to develop identity rights and awareness. And so 
basically what I'm arguing for in the book and what I'm arguing for here is for social movement activists to be aware of the narratives that they're using and to use them strategically. I think oftentimes the narratives that are being told are not strategically deployed. Awareness of narratives as a critical part of anti-caste system opens opportunity structures for strategic change. Stories are not unimportant, artfully deployed, they are only means, they're the, I would argue they're the only means of systems change. That it's through the narratives and through the sharing of narratives that we can start to do what I think Thorat was, was, was mis, Dr. Thorat was kind of hinting at earlier, bringing people together to create that. How do we create the spaces and the structures in which people can come together and share their narrative. Because when I talk to many anti-caste activists, they say, why should I talk to Brahmins? Why should I talk to people in other castes, right? And so how do you create those spaces? I think it's through narrative, and I'll end with that. OK. So I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to try to go fairly quickly, but then I think you think you're going quickly, and then it just takes as whatever it takes. But um, uh, uh, we've somewhat reversed position, but uh, Scott and I. Um, but Scott, both of us are going to talk, or at least make some reference to Dewey. And part of the reason that we switched is that I was originally under the impression that Scott may not be able to make it. Um, he was in Austin, Texas, I believe, yesterday and actually flew in late night, late last night, right? Yeah, so, and it's great he's here because he has really um, uh, looked closely at uh, the sources of Embedkar's thinking, and particularly looked closely at uh, Dewey, and recently it's become available notes, um, student notes of Dewey's, and he's going to talk about the student notes. And I, I then added something to mine to set up Scott. And so part of the, uh, uh, part of the cha reason we changed over was I'm going to now kind of lead into Scott's um, talk where he's going to look much more closely. In some way, um, uh, I'm talking probably, I mean, this is early in Bedcar because we're going back to Columbia. And he, I think many of you know he was at Columbia and studied with Dewey in uh, 1913 to 1916. Is that? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm. I'm the title of our overall panel is actually a Society of Equals. So I sort of devoted some of my time just to think a little bit about well, what did uh, and Bedkar have in mind by a Society of Equals? And Society of Equals seems very important to a Bedkar. So. And he doesn't necessarily single out Dalit simply. It's a society of equals of which we're all living together in the same place, deliberating together about the public good, right? And um, Professor Thorat really ended on a note where he also talked about Dewey and made reference to Dewey and talked about uh, social consensus. And social consensus, you know, how is that possible, right? And it's actually going to be partly a chicken and egg problem because one of the things that stands in the way of social consensus is social inequality. <laughs> and one of the things that might be a solution for social inequality is to get a conversation going among everybody, right, to overcome the social inequality that, that people are having to live with. Um, but I'm going to focus on the, the social consensus side. What makes social consensus possible? Um, uh, what does it require? What was Embedkar thinking? Um, um, I also think about lots of little things about Embedkar, and I was really enlisted in it in our, in our leader, uh, Larry Simon, uh, um, uh, but uh, because he said, could you give a talk on Dewey and Embedkar? And I was brought up in an English-speaking university and we didn't actually read much Dewey, and Dewey was not generally thought to be a philosopher that one would even think to read. Um, he was read in English departments, maybe, but maybe not even then. And then the few people who read him said, oh, I just don't understand that. Um, many more are reading it now, but when I was starting out, people were not doing that. 
So um, as I mentioned, Professor Thorat already be, took a huge step in moving us in what I believe is the right direction in, trying, in thinking about social consensus. It's the source of all our rights, no rights without social consensus, but now what makes social consensus possible? How do we trigger that? How do we catalyze that? How do we get that going? Um, recent writing in English speaking philosophy on equality has helped in this regard or moved us really in the right direction. Wouldn't you know, of course, English speaking philosophers write about equality, but it has actually not been very helpful, and it's certainly not been helpful in understanding caste. Uh, that, uh, I think. Three ways of thinking about equality have sort of dominated the recent scholarship in philosophy, and when I mean Dominated in philosophy, I'm thinking of the English-speaking world, so I'm thinking of England, the United States, and Australia. Um, there are three ways of thinking about quality. They not only miss the mark, but they obscure more than they reveal about what's wrong with caste. I mean, it might be worth writing even a very simple article, like, what's so terrible about caste? <laughs> or, what's so bad about caste? Um, or, what's so wrong? And these notions of equality the inequality of caste is not necessarily captured by them. First, equality is seen generally in a lot of the recent scholarship in philosophy as a matter of envy-free distribution of resources, given that this given giving that, that, that this may not even be an account, this may not even be an account of philosophy. A uh, number of philosophers, one philosopher who actually is right down the road, Tim Scanlon, who teaches at Harvard and has just only recently retired, um, and is sort of a kind of was brought in as a kind of replacement at the very end of uh, it was brought in to sort of so sort of as a mini John Rawls um, uh, into the department of philosophy. Um, he he's puzzled by why what's so what's so terrible about inequality. Why are you upset about the difference? Don't you only get upset if you don't have enough and what you need for yourself? So as long as you're not allowed to fall below a certain line, anything over and above that that you don't get, like do you need three, three somebody else has three yachts, right? Why should that be something we need to correct for? And isn't that just envy and by thinking of it in those terms, philosophers have actually given equality and inequality somewhat of a bad name because it makes you think that all the conversation about equality is about envy <laughs> and talking about envy and it's not as very thinly disguised. Um, so, um, uh, second, the Napoleonic Code has sort of obsessed philosophers and even my own teacher, John Rawls, used to sort of begin actually talking, if we just sat around in his office talking about equality and inequality, like what is, e what is inequality, what is equality, he would start by discussing uh, uh, the civil service and uh, the early days of the civil service, service, service where jobs were where jobs were where, where you could get a job because of uh, who you knew. <laughs> and. Um, uh, the Napoleonic Code saying, let's, let's have a civil service exam, which was actually originally thought of by the Chinese, and brought then, and then introduced into Europe, right, as a way of equalizing competition for public office. But then there was immediately the discovery that some had a leg up in competing for, pu for public office because they came from families with libraries, with lots of books. So public libraries come in as a part. And so the conception of equality started to, the picture of equality that emerged was, it was a corrective. It's correcting um, uh, for characteristics over which you have very little control. You just happen to be born into this family. Right? Um, and so you had a lot of books. If you didn't have a lot of books, we've got to give everybody equal access to books. So that makes it. But this doesn't really help us think about caste. This, uh, th th this way of thinking about equality as, as um, in, in this form. Where equality is by and large regarded as a corrective of arbitrary social advantages where the focus is on correcting for certain characteristics of which is having no way of control. Recent scholars have been also too narrowly focused, now here we could have some disagreement, on divisible, privately appropriated goods such as income and resources and welfare. 
The big obsession by most economists and by even my own teacher, John Rawls, was in distributive justice. And it's really about who gets what and how much. And the way you thought about equality was you thought of it as the benefits and burdens that attach to social positions. It's not that they're different social positions, they're not that they're differences in the society, but if people are doing the same thing, if, and they've got the same batting average or whatever, um, and they both play first base or first and second base, then they should get the same pay. So it's a benefit and a burden that attaches to the social position. Um, and, um, and most recently, the, uh, actually schol the, the scholarship in philosophy on equality has focused on compensating for bad luck. Um, so it's, it's sort of a grand uh, project. And that also comes back and is true of my teacher, John Rawls, who thought maybe it's also unfair, not only if you're born into families where you get a special social advantage because they have books, and so you can compete more successfully on the civil service exam, but um, maybe you just won out in the genetic lottery, in the, in the natural lottery of talents. And you just lucked out in the gene pool and there was something that was attracting certain businesses that you were capable of doing, but through no real uh, effort or uh, work of your own, and you wouldn't be entitled to it. So Rawls thought maybe then we should not, um, we should correct for uh, people winning out in the natural lottery of talents. This has now led to a, a lot of writing in, in English speaking world on luck egalitarianism, right? Um, I don't know if you, we could have a lo much longer conversation, but all these things don't seem to me to get at what's so terrible about caste. And the, in this and all this, something has been overlooked. Now, being overlooked is not something so strange. We often do this, and we do it in, fi in physics. It's also, it also happens in philosophy. And one way that philosophy sometimes gets done is that, that some of the best philosophy makes the invisible visible. Generally, we tend to think of philosophy as a matter of argument. Did, I, did you win the argument and making a good argument? But in much philosophy, uh, much of the best philosophy is often taking something that we all took for granted, uh, about which we've become complacent, um, about that habit has made dull and bring it explicitly to light. And it doesn't necessarily mean you do anything with it. You just sort of bring it to light. So now what are we going to do with this? Right. And I actually think in Bedkar is then, an, I make him an honorary philosopher because I see what he did with caste is to bring the invisible to light. He actually noticed things about the way caste works and the way it's structured that had somehow been right under everybody's nose, but they took it for granted or habit just made it dull. You know, I mean, did, you didn't notice it and so he did this. So I had a, whole, a little section on other examples of this, but I'm going to skip over that because just in the interest of time. So here, here's something that gets overlooked. I don't know if anybody can see it. We can do this one, but everybody notice what's being overlooked? Jeremy's got it already. Yeah, tie. Everybody see it now? Did it leap out at you? Right? Now, I, I know I haven't made any argument or anything. I think a bed card does this with cast. He kind of, suddenly you see something that you didn't see before, but guess what? It's right there, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, we're gonna skip over this. Yes, no, what do you mean, no? <laughs> oh, you don't want to talk about it? You don't want to talk about inequality? What do you mean? No, we can't skip over it. The, uh, Dura did a woodcut. There was a rhino. People in Europe didn't see rhinoceroses till the early part of the 16th century. One showed up in Spain. And it was given to, the, to, to, to a highly placed individual by the king of Spain, uh, King Philip at the time, to uh, as a as a prize and put on board ship, 
and the ship sank on the way to Italy. And Dura, and everybody talks about this in Europe. I know how everybody gets wind of it, I have no idea. But anyway, Dura does a very famous woodcut of a rhino. And it's sort of steel plated. It has these sort of plates on it, like it's a kind of tank of some sort, right? Um, and this becomes, everybody then sees, that's how they see, there's the Dura woodcut from 1515. Guess what? He never saw the rhino. And the rhino was at the bottom of the sea because they actually attached it with chains so it wouldn't fall off the deck. And so it went down with the ship. <laughs> uh, this is, though, from a natural history magazine in the 19th century. And it's still got the Dura plates. Show you how powerful a kind of particular way of looking is. It's like he, Dura frames it, and then everybody, it's not a rhinoceros unless it has this, but then I shouldn't do this. This is a photo of a rhinoceros. Where's the plate? Where are the plates? <laughs> um, and, uh, but this is in, in the middle of the 19th century uh, in a natural history museum, which is meant to, a natural history uh, book, which is to show you how rhinos really look. Galileo was the first to discover craters on the moon. I'm going to skip this. But, um, but part of the reason we think he did that is he was actually first hired at Vasari School for Art, where he taught artists to draw shadows of reticulated spheres. And so the things he saw, didn't think he didn't think they were smudges on his telescope. He thought they might be outcroppings as the sun passed along, and that maybe the moon is just like the Earth. Um, and has a surface that has promontories. It was thought to be, at that point, the religious view was absolutely immaculate, right? Absolutely sort of smooth. And he, he's, he these are Galileo's first drawings. This, this is much too, this much, we're gonna skip over this. I know, I know. Right. This is the fun stuff, right? Oh yeah, and that's Thomas Harriot, who had the same power telescope, okay. So, so 13 ways of looking at a blackbird are uh, 12 too many for most English-speaking English philosophers. I, I mean, uh, they like to think that they're, you know, but it seems pretty evident that quality is not one idea, but several. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's probably true also of philosophy. There are various ways of doing philosophy, um, you know, thinking of it as a teaching, thinking of it as thought and slow motion, thinking of it all sorts of, or thinking of it as making the invisible visible. And in that, uh, if that counts as philosophy, then so does Embedkar, because he does that, and his mentor, if we can call him a mentor, Dewey does it too. Um, Dewey's often, it's hard for me to figure out his arguments, but Scott, what's well, gonna help right, with that? So what was Embedkar's idea of equality? I'm gonna sort of race through this. So a number of us have come to think that equality is not one idea, but several. Um, there are at least two ideas of equality, and I'm gonna mention two, and I'm not sure I'm always describing them in the best possible way, but I wanna think that in one of the things that we've been misled into not being able to understand caste fully because we were sort of obsessed with a particular way of thinking about equality, and those are the ones that I mentioned at the early, early part of the, of, of, of begin, when I began. Um, but there's a sort of a distributive view of equality, which is actually, I, I want to call the dominant view. It's the dominant view, it's the economic, it's sort of most economists study the distributive conception of equality. Um, uh, but there's a non-hierarchical or relational view which doesn't necessarily quite capture it. This is also probably another way of talking about it, but it's not common. Maybe we're going to make it more common, maybe more, more part of the vernacular, but economic versus social equality. Social equality is something that I think Embedkar is talking about when he talks about social inequality, when he talks about caste. Um, Inequalities are generally thought, as I mentioned earlier, that the benefits and burdens that attach to social positions, and, and the issue among egalitarians is the difference in their views of the unit that is to be distributed. So what are we distributing? 
but they just need a division. They need a, a clear division, so, you know, the opportunities should be equal. So, um, and the uh, goods should be equal. Um, distributive equality has an advantage. It's easily quantifiable and measurable. Social inequality is much harder to know how to measure it or necessarily how to think about it. I think Professor Thorat referred to it, and it doesn't quite fit some other, this other conception of economic equality. Social equality, where distribution is less of an issue than, distribution is less of an issue with social equality. It's not that the social equality doesn't have an effect on the distribution, but, or an impact, is it, it, it's less of an issue than equal concern and respect. Take, for example, the gay and lesbian community where they sought, uh, what they sought is best understood not so much in distributive terms. What they sought and what they seek is first and foremost is recognition. Um, and indeed, seeing their inequality in distributive terms more often than not obscures more than it reveals about their dilemma. This too is true of the situation that Dalits find themselves in, and a social rather than a distributive idea or model of inequality best captures their plight. Um, and I think that the uh, kind of equality, and it's actually curious, and it's very hard to parse and to figure out exactly what it means, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, and then I'm, I'm going to end here. Um, but uh, we, we need everybody's help to try to figure this out. But because um, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but there, and Bedkar draws, I think, very heavily from Dewey. Um, this is um, in the Annihilation of Caste in 1936, he draws on much that was in Dewey's Democracy and Education, which apparently, and Scott may actually say something about this, he was working on just before. Um, and Bed Carter left Columbia, but didn't teach a course on it. Is that correct? We'll be up time, yeah. I'll what? Say yeah, I'll what? Say it during my talk. <laughs> yeah, you'll do it. I'll yeah, shut yeah. up. Okay, you're, you're, well, that's a preview of coming attraction, there right? Right. right, we'll get, get the answer to that. So, um, this is democracy and education, and annihilation of caste. Um, so some sign, some small clue in what Ambedkar had in mind when he thought of a society of equals may be found, I think, in Dewey's idea of democracy, which is actually not the standard view of democracy that you and I might have, and Ambedkar's appropriation of it. Um, uh, in, when he talks about equality, when he talks about a society of equals, he, he seems to draw on many of the phrases that Dewey uses in talking about democracy. So here's Ambedkar. And now I'm going to just do a couple of quotes, some of which I did a few years ago and some of which are added. But democracy is not merely a form of government. It's primarily a mode of associated living or conjoint communicated experience. Do you notice it already has echoes of social consensus? I mean, it's like moving to make social consensus possible. If it's just simply a form of, gov a form of government, a, pr a mode, a, a way of selecting one's governors, right, one each can individually go to the polls and vote. It's primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. It is essentially an attitude of respect and reverence towards fellow men. Um, a democracy is more, and here's Dewey, a democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. These more numerous and more varied points of contact denote a greater diversity of stimuli to which an individual has to respond. I think that touches on also something that Jeremy mentioned and was concerned about. To how do you get people together? How do you get them in contact with one another? And there's a conception here that underlies it, uh, underlies this, well, that Embedkar seemed to have in mind that needed to kind of evolve and, and find its place in order for that kind of contact to take place. Um, it was a key idea in Dewey that democracy was not merely a means for selecting one's governors or holding elections every two or four years. It was a mode of life, a way of living in the world, democratic living, and Embedkar believed it too. Dewey also thought of it as a kind of a character trait, and it was something you could cultivate certain habits of mind and habits of heart. 
Um, and so they could be practiced in, not only in public, but in private. And you could actually train for appearing in public by working on treating those you loved and cared about more democratically or in this, in this, this associated manner. Um, uh, and then there's endosmosis, um, which maybe uh, uh, in looking back, just because it's such a strange term, we, uh, it's attempting to make more of it than one should. But it's a key idea in Wu Dewey and key to his idea of democracy. And then Bedkar adds the adjective social, so social democracy, social equality, when he speaks of it, which is almost redundant, but which shows how committed he was not just to changing politics and law, but to a total, a total tra social transformation. A society which is mobile, which is full of channels for the distribution of a change occurring anywhere, must see to it that its members are educated to personal <coughs> initiative and adaptability. Um, this is a sort of typical Dewey, and it, it actually is talking about how much he's sort of enamored of flexibility, openness, right? not, not, not building walls. Um, in short, there are many interests consciously communicated and shared and varied in free points of contact with other modes of association large variety of shared undertakings and experience otherwise the influences which otherwise the influences which educate some into masters educate others into slaves the separation to a privilege and a subject class prevents endosmosis so um, living together as equals um, whoops sorry um, you're at about 25 minutes I've gone 25 okay yeah. stop now I have to stop then uh, thanks so I'm going to just go over the right. So Scott is going to now further this and take it on by talking about the uh, early days. All right, thanks for setting me up. Yeah. I think I did wrestle this. That's maybe pretty intense. No, it used to be up here, but it disappeared. Let's see, maybe right here it is. All right, there we go. Let's do this. I'm going to keep my time here, so I should be able to go 15. So poor Siraj doesn't have to do this at the library. Um, let's see. This project started in 2014. I'm going to go kind of quick because I only have 15 minutes, and I, it's, uh, this is a passion of mine. In 2014, I was at Princeton on research leave, and I, I figured, you know, I started to get wind of this wonderful person, uh, Ben Rowan Bedcar, you all know of. And I am a specialist in John Dewey's philosophy. And so I, I, uh, you know, I got, he's a student of Dewey. No one's told the story of pragmatism in India. And so I started looking at the literature, and there's wonderful stuff that's out there that is continuing to be done, like Andreas's wonderful project that says he was influenced by Dewey. And let's find some ideas that are parallel to Dewey's. And this is very valuable from a conceptual scheme, right? Because it helps us see Embedkar as a pragmatist because of the touchstone of pragmatist ideas. Uh, but the story I kept wanting to know was what happened at Columbia. What did he learn from Dewey? Because one thing I've learned myself about Dr. Embedkar, when he starts talking about democracy, as Andreas just pointed out, you'll be able to find a text in the Deweyan corpus where that line came from. That's how great Embedkar's library was. That's how great his memory was. And that's how great his influence at the hands of Dewey was. So this is kind of my operative principle. Let's try to do a good historical job of tracking what text led to what influence in uh, Ben Brown Bedkar's corpus. So let me go through this. This is the one conference I don't have to have a slide explaining who Embedkar is. I just got through presenting to a bunch of Deweyans on Friday, and they had to have that. But the question again is, how was Dewey influential? There's three vectors I've been able to identify. One are the classes he had uh, in the fall of 1914 and then the year of 1915 and 16. I'll get back to that. Two, his books. I've been to Siddhartha College in Mumbai, and, and I've looked at every annotation in the surviving library of Bimrao and Bedkar, and I can confidently tell you on about three criterion, I don't have time to explain, on the, any criterion you pick, the one book that is most engaged by Bimrao and Bedkar is Dewey's 1916 Democracy and Education. 
Okay, so Dewey was incredibly influential. And I'll start to spell out uh, here and elsewhere what, what this is. This is going to be a book project, but uh, this will give you a taste of it. And the last one is kind of uh, like Andreas has noticed, other people have noticed that, you know, you start to look at the text of Embedcar and you see the words of Dewey weaved into that, and then you try to figure out what he's doing with those. I'll focus on the first two in today's talk. So the first one, clearly Dewey's books were loved by Embedcar, and unlike some of our students, well, Dewey and Baker was like our students, right? Sometimes the first chapter of a book is underlined. Books like Democracy and Education have underlined the whole book. So, so Embedkar was inf infatuated with this kind of philosophy from beginning to end. And in Democracy and Education in 1916, uh, Embedkar sees some key things that become writ large in 1919 to the Southboro testimony, uh, you know, that text, also 1936, Annihilation of Caste, and also in his later writings in the 1950s. He sees things that's like society exists in and through communication. He sees things like reconstruction of tradition. One of the only explicit quotations of Dewey in Annihilation of Caste, right, refers to the reconstruction of past materials. And he also sees this idea of democracy as a way of life. And here's his actual underlinings from Embedkar's personal copy where he writes this line and underlines it. I go into the influence of this text more at that site you see on the bottom. He's also very much influenced by another text, 1908, The Dewey and Tufts Ethics. Now, this is a real mystery. It's signed K.A. Kaluskar. My friend Chris Queen has noticed this as well when he perused the library, but none of us can figure out when he got this. I've written a chapter in Dr. Glave's recent book, but I, I speculate it was like around 1930, 1931, and I give my reasons for that. But I think Kaluskar gave him this book later in life. I don't think student Embedkar had this book. But nonetheless, you judge from his underlinings in this book, he was captivated by Dewey's view of the key to morality and progress in morality was going from custom-based morality to reflective morality. This, by the way, disappears in Dewey and Tufts' 1932 total revision of the ethics book. It's only in the 1908 ethics book. So he was captivated by this idea, and that's what he tells the Hindu uh, upper caste reformers in 1936, right? He also gets this distinction between principle and rule. That's there in the Buddha and his Dhamma when he explains Buddha's view on ahimsa. It's not a rule, it's a flexible principle. He gets this from John Dewey's philosophy. Uh, now, again, back to the key question I want to focus on in my last 10 minutes here, which is a fascinating question. I don't think anyone has really been able to answer it, and so I'm going to try to give my humble attempt at an answer, and then someone else could tell me I'm stupid and wrong. Uh, what did Embedkar hear at Columbia? What did he learn at Columbia? This is actually a book on the ledge outside of Siddhartha, library, Siddhartha College's library. So I worry about some of these books surviving a long time if this is how some of them are kept. Uh, what did he take at, at Columbia? This is the first question. Francis Pritchett, uh, emeriti professor at Columbia University, has put together a list of his courses on the website Embedcar at Columbia. This is helpful, but it's not totally the answer I want, right? Who taught these classes? There are five philosophy classes listed on that. So I go to the Columbia archives, and I dig out the musty bulletins. And so I, I now have an idea of who taught every class he took, and I have an idea of what was in every one of those classes. Of those five classes, two were by a philosopher named Montague, who we don't care about anymore. He was a new realist. He really defined himself as an opponent of Dewey's philosophy. Okay, no wonder that didn't, he, you don't see anything from uh, Montague in any of Embedkar's works. Three of those classes, however, are confirmed Dewey classes. Philosophy 231, that's a fall 1914 class on psychological ethics, and philosophy 131, 132, that's a year-long course, two courses taught by Dewey, more on political philosophy. Okay. Other things that I've learned in digging, there's no evidence he took Dewey's class on history of philosophy of education at Columbia. Uh, and if you look at his copy of Democracy and Education, it's, da it's dated by him. God bless him for dating it. He, it's dated January of 1917 when he was in London. It actually says London. So he, I, you know, I, I think it's fairly defensible to say what he learned in those classes, and I'll go into that in a second, had nothing to do with what he took from Democracy and Education. So there's kind of two streams of Dewey's thought here that kind of merge into all of his quotations and references later in life. So now the question is, uh, you know, where does some of this stuff appear? What did he learn? Now, we all know about his review of Bertrand Russell's book, uh, you know, Principles of Social Reconstruction, and there he makes his first published reference to the philosophy of Dewey, and then he doesn't really quote things, but he, you can see that he's referring to a Dewey in distinction. You have the, the preamble or preface to the Constitution of India, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. Well, when I dug through the Dewey archives and found notes from his classmates on philosophy 131, 132, uh, you notice one of the days, November 10th, that Bedkar is a substitute note-taker. 
So, so the, in, in these notes from 1915, 1916, what is, do we talk about? A lot of different things I'm still unpacking, but he mentions equality, fraternity, and liberty. What else does he mention? The exact distinction and the way of putting it that Bedkar referred to in that review of Dewey, of uh, Russell's book. So again, this kind of always sticks in my mind. If he mentions Dewey, there's got to be a text somewhere. Okay, and in this case, the text where the lecture notes from Dewey. Uh, he also has uh, a kind of critique of non-resistance. He's talking about Tolstoy here, but in that review of Bertrand Russell, right, I talk about it more in this recent publication. He's worried about Indian readers seeing Tolstoy's non-resistance like Gandhian non-resistance. And so Embedkar uses his teacher Dewey's philosophy of force as effective means, not always violent means, but effective means as a way to combat that. So that's something what he, of what he learned in 1915, 1916, his last year at Columbia with Dewey. But the question I want to talk about today is something I haven't talked about in public or written on. Uh, what did he learn in fall 1914? How close can we get to a transcript of what he heard from Dewey? So it, what was the class in fall of 1914? Well, it's philosophy 231. That's Dewey's psychological ethics. I don't know why they have such awfully long course titles. In my university, no one would take a class title that sounds like a thesis sentence. Uh, so I'll call it psychological ethics. And uh, you know, another question that comes up is why didn't he take the companion one to that? And I've been able to figure out an answer from my reading of his transcript. You look closely at the times all these classes were offered. In the spring, he took Economics 242 from Simcovich, who's an interesting figure who's going to play in my story of the doing influence. Simcovich's wife was Mary Kingston Simcovich, who ran a settlement house like Jane Addams. But her, Simcovich's settlement house was in uh, Greenwich Village in New York, and the Dewey spoke there. So, so this is part of why Embedkar is kind of immersed in this Dewey and Jane Addams view of how to change society. Uh, but he took Simcovich's classes, so he might have lost interest in Dewey's class, or had to get taking classes that he was an economics major effectively, so at some point he couldn't dabble in philosophy as much as he might want. So now let's start to answer this question. What did he hear in Phil 231, 232? He actually only took 231, right? Uh, you know, you look, so I'm trying to construct an answer by looking at the student notes, student outlines, and uh, even Dewey's notes that are in the Dewey Center at Southern Illinois Carbondale that kind of start to answer this. So I can start to put together an idea of what he heard. And at the end of this, in about five minutes, according to my timer, I'll uh, give you some of the payoff of where it appears in Embedkar's uh, Annihilation Cast. But basically, this class is focused on what men do like psychologically, how they act, and then morally, how they should act, the kind of interaction between descriptive and normative issues. Okay? Dewey has three topics at the beginning of one of the course outlines I found for this. Place intelligence in behavior. This is a term that's particular to Dewey, and you start to see this every once in a while in Embedkar's uh, discussion, especially with Russell. Uh, he also springs to action, what motivates us, impulses, emotions, and then the relation of self to character. Now let's get a little more specific. Uh, in these, this outline from Dewey's class, again, I cannot bear, you know, it doesn't have Embedkar's name on it like some of the other notes I've found, but uh, again, it's a reliable record of what he heard in the class. And I've also found semi-reliable records from years after Embedkar was there. So through all of these things, you see, Dewey used to have outlines and notes, and he would come to class and he would wrinkle them up and then just go on his own tangent. So he, sometimes what he has as his notes are different from what students heard in his class. And sometimes different students hear different things. So, so all of this is kind of a triangulation exercise. But you also notice, and I'll move past this quickly, Dewey refers to Buddhism and quiescence right here in 1914. So think of this. Young Embedkar is listening to his great American teacher who doesn't have any deep knowledge of Indian tradition. And he's, re, you know, he's connecting it, Buddhism, as one of these philosophies that uh, says impulses are bad. You know, and now Ambedkar may not agree with that because that's kind of a shoddy reading of Buddhism, but he at least hears pragmatism being engaged with Buddhism. What he starts to hear Dewey say is interesting. Dewey starts saying morality is about these impulses we have, kind of vague impulses to action. All humans, are, we don't just wait for some stimuli to come and then respond to it. We're outgoing into the world. Dewey has this story since 1896, the reflex arc, uh, you know, important essay in psychology. Uh, but what he starts to say in here is very intriguing, right? He starts to say civilizations can channel these impulses into the form of habits, largely. So habits are accomplishments with a past and project future activity. Even more important than this, right, is that there's certain kinds of mental habits. 
Habits not just involve uh, chewing your fingernails or something like, or smoking. Habits are means in the Dewey and scheme. And so Young and Bedcar in 1914 starts to hear Dewey talk about mental habits called attitudes, which are readinesses or tendencies to act. And that these attitudes aren't just specific actions, they're tractions or repulsions. They have valence, they have an affective quality to them. Right? So if I like to smoke, that cigarette is awesome. If I don't have the habit of smoking, that cigarette means a coughing fit, dare I inhale it. So uh, you know, these, these, these habits, these attitudes of mind are valenced. He also hears Dewey introduce something that would come later in print. Dewey calls it the philosophical fallacy. This is where philosophers put a label on something and then think that something exists. The most classic example of this is in faculty psychology. When you say there is the human mind has the imagination and rational, and then you start digging through the brain and looking for the imagination part of it. Okay, so this is, you took the word too seriously. So in this class, Young and Bedkar starts to hear Dewey talk about words are useful abstractions but can be misleading when we reify them when we think that there is one thing called anger, not anger towards this truck, anger towards this tax burden, anger towards this situation, you see? Anger is a contextually defined thing, yet the word sounds like it's one thing. Now, this is the payoff, and I'll end here. I'm actually a minute and a half early. Uh, you look at things like the Annihilation of Caste, and look at how he talks about caste, right? One of the intriguing differences in Embedkar's work from 1916, the essay on caste, is that essay on caste is negative, but it's much more like an anthropological paper. By 1936, Embedkar has a normative angle to it. Caste is this thing, and caste is awful. Now, what is this thing? And an interesting, you know, epicycle he has in 1936 is that it's a notion, a state of mind, a mental habit, he calls it, right? And in this passage, you see all those things I've said he heard in 1914 from Dewey start to pop up at you. And I've put them in red ink, but you should start, you know, they start to like look like the Dewey and phrases he's taking elsewhere. So all reform consists in a change in the notions, sentiments, and mental attitudes of the people towards men and things. It's a common experience that certain names become associated with certain notions and sentiments which determines a person's attitude towards men and things. So here you start to see those same things that Dewey was talking about in the boring language of psychology and embed cards appropriating them from his pragmatist teacher and turning them and twisting them and adapting them to the situation of what caste is, why it's bad, and how to get at it. If it's something in the head, then you have to have some kind of way of adjusting people's habits or states of mind. So I'll end there, but uh, nonetheless, I just want to keep telling, uh, you know, my one note I've, I've been working on and I want to continue working on is that uh, we fail to really understand in Bedkar if we don't see him as a pragmatist. Now that doesn't mean he's just doing the same thing Dewey is doing. In many ways, he goes beyond Dewey. And so I have to give this type of talk to my pragmatist friends and say, Dewey was limited by his context and Bedkar is in a different context and so his pragmatism flowers in different ways. So I think that's an interesting conclusion of this, is that if we start looking into how he was a pragmatist, what made him become a pragmatist, we can start to tell additional stories to add to all the different cool ways we start to cut up the diamond that is in Bedkar. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, actually, I have one question for you, I mean, to begin with, and we can talk later. Yeah, get this ugly graphic off there. Oh, it's a bit beautiful. How um, do we do that? Maybe, you know, Scott, you have to give us uh, maybe inside perspective of what it, you know, pragmatism as a, you know, um, kind of praxis, you know, as a construct, then you know, escaping it. Um, I would like to acknowledge everybody for being here. Uh, thank you so much. This is the last not a good position to be. Don't rush me, please. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll try to finish it. Um, so um, there are some uh, caveats. I will, I will throw new uh, concepts uh, which might not be familiar with. Uh, and uh, so that's the beauty of working with philosophy. Sometimes you just develop certain concepts and then you work on it and you're not confined. So I enjoy that privilege, at least in this paper. paper. Um, I don't know how to do this. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I would like to dedicate this talk to our brother, uh, Rohit Vemula, whose sacrifice has really brought this consciousness of the modern era. And he has taught us what it means to be a talent. You know? He is...
uh, he has framed, he has, he has jettisoned the idea of what it means to be the Dalit, the philosophical understanding of, of being in a cosmic realities and being a Dalit, you know, to, to be someone and not be someone at the same time within this cosmic uh, uh, derangement. And, and uh, uh, Ruhit was someone who spoke to us and for us, for our suffering, for our life, for our being, that remained brutally suppressed by the falsified narratives. I live in a Brahmin world. Everywhere I turn my head, I see a Brahmin in positions of power, undeterred and unwilling to acknowledge his or her status quo. In every field and in the space of intellectualism, culture, commerce and religion, I see a Brahmin, an allied oppressive caste folks, they are simply not satisfied with the occupations of power. She or he is plotting everyday strategies to make my life look unworthy. I am not a human, I am a Dalit first. I am not a colleague, I am a Dalit. I am not a friend, I am a Dalit. I am not co-maker of the moment, I am a Dalit. For the Brahminical society, I have no agency and the determination to live the way I want to anywhere in the world. I am constantly watched as the capital O other and the destitute. I am forced to live in the world where I am seconded. I am the second, the Brahmin, and their universality is primary. I aim to take the responsibilities of my, I am to take the responsibilities of my action without my fault. I have to live a life of twofold, one for myself and the second for the Brahmin's reaction to it. This cosmological servility is bounded to my presence. A minority handful of Brahmins and allied castes want to retain their domination upon me, my body. The minority Brahmins and allied caste not only want to subordinate fellow Brahmins, but want to expand the subordination to everyone around them. They want to destroy the ecological harmony and control the existentialism. I have subscribed to a Dalit Adivasi news portal that delivers everyday digest report, uh, who reports incidents on the Dalit atrocities. Five years ago, they would send a daily digest with news items ranging from four to six reports. The daily digest was run by activists in Uttar Pradesh. Based on the reported incidents, the overseas-based Dalit diaspora would fume into anger and work on running rehabilitation projects or advocacy programs for the affected. The news that often was reported and received wide attention was the issue of death and rape. It is at these moments that were contemporaneous to my being when I was forced to rethink about myself in an identity that I thought I had and carried with me. My identity so far was reflected with how the society forced its gaze upon me. I was an Indian, a South Asian, a Dalit, male, heterosexual, brown, black and so on. Never to my conscious identity that I was labelled into mattered to me as much as it mattered to the people who had an excitement about trademarking the unique individuality in an unproductive route upon me. As the news came, a documentary noted by uh, 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 by noted director Stalin titled India and Touch was released. There was a, bu a buzz about this film and as I was sitting in my apartment covered under layers writing a piece on why not called lower caste, I aimed to build this piece with the radical black movement of the US where phenotypical stereotypes were tumbled upside, upside down challenging the vulgar white gaze. I also thought of myself as a product of rapacious consumerism carried into our livelihoods. I argued in this piece why should a lower caste quote unquote term be avoided for it is on, not only a psychological revivalism but it also a moment of Dalit assertion. After I finished sending the piece to the email news digest I received responses and some outlets carried their publication. Before I could make sense of my quote unquote uniqueness in an very informed uh, Edward Saidian way of orientalist I was out on the fumigating task of bringing forth a certain affirmation to my sense of being. I had to inadvertently prove when no one asked me to do so. Why was I living under the orders of this invisible phantom? I was not part of it and neither a differential arrangement made sense of it. Beingness of a Daliting came to me in a visceral invisibility. The two-ness of identifications were now to come to terms with. The measurement of seeing self with someone else's perception laden with unvisited territoriality of ourself. This made more demeaning harm to the unrecognized other. Sartre describes how it means to look self in the eyes of others. Sartre describes, it is the other's perfection that you constantly try to fit into. He argues that the gaze of others robs us of our inherent freedom that we hold. Therefore, our existence being for itself is falsely identified as being in itself.
Before we begin to address the epistemological question of being a Dalit, we, need, we would need to understand the philosophical foundations of beingness. The being is a connotation of existence, but also a fatality of non-existence. We as suppressed humans privilege vitality of existence over non-existence. However, non-existence is the dimmer of one's doubts of being a being. If beingness is adhered to the presentness, as Aristotelian Heidegger would observe, then the agency, space, and time become central to our problematic. One would know that Heidegger was not much interested in the problematic as much as he was interested in the problem itself. To add to the presentness, it is the continuity of stability that brings attention to the beingness. The stability and the continuance of stability is what marks beingness, according to Heidegger. The definite principle of ausia, it's a, it's a Greek term, the presentness, which is I am, is very striking. Thus, for Aristotle example, the meaning of being is more fundamental to the meaning of society. It's a fundamental difference, being a society and being an individual being. The central aspect of one's beingness is the quality of the analogous comparison with the who I am. It is an effort to bring a consciousness to the dialectic of the beingness. Therefore, to build a parenthesis of the beingness in a parallel context, one has to imagine a parallel world so as to bridge the... The, the literal meanings of what it means to be a parallel word and not a mythical character. Therefore, being has to be formed in the beingness. Beingness here is all encompassing, enabling structure of uni-being or a united one metamorphosis of being. Du Bois suggests the principle Du Bois suggests the principle of double consciousness that has that having two selves is to go, it goes deep down. According to him, it's two self. Two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two varying ideals in one dark body. The double senseness comes from a deeply spiritually rooted philosophical traditions to exterior and interior. Buddha was propon proponent of this, this notion. Then we can go with he Hegel's dialectics and then also Goethe explains about the two souls in his, in his very poetic sense where each, there are two souls, each is trying to separate and form into the information. Meaning, there is already an information, there is a structure which is fully formed, thus the form needs to be assimilated into it. So there are these two beings. Ambedkar, in his reflection, uh, puts the idea of beingness in a very Aristotelian sense as a socially based, far removed from isolated being of individuality. Ambedkar is putting this, this, this social dynamics of individual and he quotes, uh, it's here. Aristotle has said that man is a social being, whatever be the cogency. The reasons of Aristotle in support of his statement, this much is true that it is impossible for anyone to begin life as an individualistic in the sense of radically separating himself from his social fellows. The social bond is established and rooted in the very growth of self-consciousness. Each individual's apprehension of his own personal self and its interest involves the recognition of others and their interest. And, his, and this is important. And his pursuit of one type of purpose, which is generous or selfish, is in so far the pursuit of other also. So, in 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 Aristotle's uh, uh, hypothesis, it is as much as a selfish rooted individual construct, but it is also has to do with an equal relation. The pursuit of others. When you see yourself in the mirror, you would also like to see the same reflected in other person also. So it's, it's very personal as to how we see ourselves in the society. And this is what informs the beingness of Dalit. And this is what the being Dalit means, is to mirror yourself into what oppressive society looks like and into how we face oppression. The principles of fraternity liberty are the modular to the political considerations of this adjusted being. Baba Sahib Ambedkar proposed the idea of fraternity and liberty and this he he's, he's very much invested in the idea of fraternity because fraternity is, is very essence. Brotherhood in the sense of bringing them all together. And, and he explains this. If you, if you minus fraternity from the notions of equality and liberty, you are, you are, going, to have, you are going to perish this whole, whole concept. And what does that mean? Fraternity, which Baba Zab Ambedkar is very much drawing from Aristotle, is, is about how do we remake certain notions that are affixed upon us. And, and I think that's where we have to uh, uh, escape Ambedkar's idea. I don't know how pragmatists will take this uh, about uh, the idea of individual uh, you know, uh, formations, but maybe uh, there is a case to be made. 
the presentness and the stability of an existing order is conceptual framework of the aristotel aristotelian model of beingness in the temporality of addressing a human notion into the schema very little is seen in aristotle's vision for aristotle the retiring of human souls and its actions remain core to his understanding of time and beingness for him the human souls when they retire so that's how one is one is determined like example if one is dead that is the time that's dead and that's how the beingness performs but the the time for aristotle is present it's not something someone has dead the the the, the death of every day is is what we is, is what informs here and for him the present is me and i am in the present moment right now so these are not different concepts so the time that we are the space we are and the matter we are it's part of the whole the, it it it's one it it makes the formation of one's beingness and i think the dalit vision has to be understood in this context human movement uh, according to aristotle calculation uh, brings more sense to the beingness what does that mean that that as much as time is important we have to also make a careful calculation of evolutionary aspects we don't have to have this non evolutionary dynamics to this however this unfortunately is unclear and therefore remains unmeasured but as hedegar puts it rather interestingly that time being the beingness meaning the existence of one's rationality is tied to the time and therefore emerges the time being he called time and hyphenated being uh, forms of human relation and to its surrounding i will just go towards the end so we will delve into the life of those that remain unprivileged in and with the time agency and ethos of stabilism this is the reason dalitism has to be reorganized because the question of agency and its quality is abated plato reminds about the ownership of commoner in bringing about universal peace in the society if the privileged take in command of describing the spirits and powers of society then evil will so see no end and i quote him until philosophers are kings or the kings and it's, it's a famous from the commonwealth book 5 uh, until philosophers are kings or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy and political greatness and wisdom meet in one and those commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of other are compelled to stand aside cities will never have rest from their evils this is this is this is how i think the overwhelming narrative of dalit being as an eccentric identity you know uh, overburdens the dilemma of multiple cultural differences existing within dalitism we have had a question about homogeneous and heterogeneous identity and i think that's what i want to rescue the phenomenon of dalitism it's not about this 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 very confined and eccentricism the dalithood is a broader category of inclusivity as well as that of exclusivity it is welcoming as well as exclusionary dalits do not often talk about caste or rather leave their lives of the caste debacle to experience the dalit expression of livelihood a visit to the kindled spaces of dalit ghettos excuse me and social occasions of marriage would be an ideal laboratory dalits centralize the universal location of their surrounding they not only take stock of brahminical culture but are but are also aware of the rest the suffering of the people for example in africa we have the african american the indigenous population so the idea of inclusion is not only limited to the specific you know ghettos it's it's about this broader universal imagination of dalit and i think uh, the dalit panthers and all other movements inform to us about how this incorporates i'll just quickly jump with a uh, work with cox and then finally we can conclude distinguishing between the concept of now you know obviously we have this challenging ideas of race and caste uh, so i i thought maybe let's let's also delve into it because apparently the some of these philosophers that we have that that emerged were slave owners and so there was a question if if there was a existence of racial dynamics to the slavery that you know uh, aristotle had i think six or seven slaves so so i thought maybe there is a question that we could address and i thought maybe i should uh, plunge with all oliver cox who observes that the difference between there is a difference between race and caste consciousness and for him it is bound by provincial arrangements cox argues that caste sentiments are internal inward looking whereas race is a global phenomena therefore to address the qualitative formation of caste and race one has to tease out preferential arrangements with the social groupings of caste and race race is universal in the sense that we can find traces of its bifurcation among other groups around the world however caste being internally located its aspiration tend to be defined within itself 
Therefore, the question of outer strain is limited in the cast observance system. As Cox furthermore puts it, it's the strong urge and a quote, development of socially sufficient internal organization. So caste is trying to develop its own internal organization and that's what makes caste a, a kind of very strong union because we know um, every now, the, the, the endogamy for example, it, it's, it's trying to strengthen our own internal organization and that's what makes it uh, a unique institution apart uh, in uh, indifference to race. The internal structure being caste and thus the whole energy is focused to the advancement of one's health caste belief. So if one person is in the caste, the person's universal imagination is within the caste system only. That's 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 how one, one thinks, you know. And if you want to if you want to climb a step higher, you are always looking for a person who is above you to, to, to kind of follow on the leaders. And and I think that is what is making this caste system very, very uh, uh, stringent in its formation. And I will conclude with this. Uh, the beingness of second sex, of course I'm taking from Simon de Bois. The Dalit acoustic is often male, harsh-toned and expressive fragments of the Dalit identity as a whole. This creation is, a not, is not a Dalit profiling. It is in the dominant circles where funneling of certain voices are rendered and heard. The Dalit female identity is also non-existing for the Dalit voices. The Dalit woman as observed by Simon de Bois, example, is a relative categorization of the male humanity. Thus, the independence of self-defining character is non-existent in the crass race of male centrality. The dominant caste male as well as the progressive and regressive female movements along with Dalit males and females account for the shaming. Dalit women is the most powerful resistance to the structure of caste system. The premise of any social institution built over centuries whether caste, race or the obvious patriarchy is fertilized on human subjugation. Ambedkar deals with this phenomenon in, in, in detail when he anchors sharp anthropological understanding of the caste system. It is endogamy, he argues, that is peculiar to the mystery of caste system. The Dalit female is the most oppressed group in the world. It is the victim of structures and institutions of oppression. The caste, religion, patriarchy, class and spatial on the space-wise. The Dalit woman is placed on the edges of sources of power. The Dalit woman narrative is often not discussed, neither it is gathered among the Dalit circles. The Dalit woman is not considered an agent of change or the one that has participated in the revolutions of history books. The famous narratives of Jhalkari Bai who disguised as Lakshmi Bai, bravely fought the English invaders and let the Lakshmi Bai escape with her daughter is unknown saga. In the portrayal of Dalit women, they are either presented as dark caricatured menial figures or someone unqualified to make contribution to the larger humanity. Influential writings by subaltern women have not yet become part of the everyday narrative among the progressive circles. In spite of the scholarly inputs on the Indian women writings, there are no definite efforts taken to acknowledge these important epistemological moments. Thank you. Thank you.